Coming up, winners and losers of the Vikings' first official depth chart, plus a deep dive preview into preseason game number one in Seattle this Thursday. And it's all coming up next on the Minnesota Football Party. Locked on Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota Football Party. It's your guys hanging out talking next level Vikings football. So join in with Pro Football Network's Arif Hassan, Locked On Vikings Luke Braun, Superior Sports Talk's Luke Inman, and Vikings Insider Sam Ekstrom, plus the biggest names in Minnesota football for the Minnesota Football Party. And it starts now. Back in the lab, another edition, Football Party, Lockdown Sports Minnesota Network. This is your daily breakdown of everything Minnesota Vikings. That's Sam Ekstrom. He's on Twitter, at Sam Ekstrom, co-host of the Ron Johnson Show every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Sam, you've been on the training camp grind now, going on two weeks. Practice number nine, by the way, under the bright lights. That'll be on display this evening at TCO. Mm -hmm. And let me just ask you this real quick. First off, it, it it feels like they've been out there for a month now, yet it's only practice number nine. But you've covered training camp in this team for years now. So at this point, we're about 10 days in. Now that we've heard the pads pop a little bit, you got the first preseason game inching closer and closer. What are a few things you're looking for or notice start to change a little bit as both the players and the coaches, for that matter, get more and more comfortable? But at the same time, now you got the fatigue, right? The wear and tear of this long stretch of practices. That starts to take its toll as well. Do you notice anything tangible start to change, you know, two weeks in, typically every year around this time? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that there's an appetite right away for – any information, right? Like what's the depth chart? Who are the third stringers? How many, you know, how accurate was Kirk today? How's Jaron Hall look? And I think that everyone settles into a place where they don't need quite as much information from a fan perspective. Maybe there's kind of a lull that happens about this time before we start to play the games. And that kind of reignites the fire a little bit. What I'm trying to, to balance out is the, grass is always greener bias of this Brian Flores defense because right now there's so much hype. It's so different, radically different from what Ed Donatel showed and nothing's gone wrong yet, right? So everyone just feels so good about it, all the aggressive blitzes and just the different nature of this defense. And I'm trying to, to really step back and say, is this defense really going to be improved? Because they haven't proven anything yet. All they've done is sort of change the scheme. But again, I don't want to get lulled into this false sense of security that just because it's different and exciting, it's going to be good. That's something to caution against for all the, the Flores uh, activists out there. Really good point. And I think just a general broad overview, too. At this point, mini camp, OTAs, eight practices into training camp. Coaches have a pretty good understanding which guys are going to be their core foundational pieces, which guys are going to be, you know, supplanted as the first backups and depth guys. So you've probably got, of the 53 guys they can keep, about 40 to maybe even 45 of these guys probably already locked in stone. It's mm -hmm. really just a matter of figuring out who's got the edge for these last eight to 10 to 12 spots left on the roster, along with, of course, making sure guys are prepared both mentally and physically, right, with the playbook and the verbiage, but also making sure these guys are fresh. They're ready to go. They're at 100% for that long gauntlet of a season once the grind officially starts in week one. Uh, coming up, we're going to break down the official depth chart of the season and which guys have kind of climbed the charts a little bit. Plus, later, let's do a little deep dive preview on Thursday's game versus the Seahawks, game number one for the Vikings 2023 season. But first, quick reminder, don't forget this episode brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. 
All right, plenty of practice observations I want to get to from yesterday. But first, let's start with the most recent hot topic everyone's kind of buzzing about, which is the Vikings' first official depth chart. Sam, what was the one thing or maybe one guy that jumped out to you the most when you got your hands on this first depth chart and just your biggest knee-jerk reactions? Yeah, so first of all, KOC stood up at the podium yesterday and more or less told us to burn the depth chart. Don't even pay attention to it. So take it all with a grain of salt. Um, I thought there were some ludicrous designations here that where they were just trying to not throw a veteran under the bus. I always feel this way. They always do this. They always try to tell us they're gaslighting us, Luke. They're sugarcoating a little bit. They're telling us what, what is not true with our eyes. Like I have not seen Ross Blacklock take more than a handful of second team reps and they, they stick him with the twos when Jaquel and Roy's clearly been above him in the rotation. Uh, Troy Reader with the twos above Ivan Pace Jr., that's asinine. Andrew Booth Jr., again, he's been hurt. And I, I believe that he's with the twos. I guess more so I'm confused why Makai Blackman would be with the threes. That one didn't make any sense to me. So, again, they're they're keeping the rookies down. They don't want to irk any veterans by burying them so early in camp. But again, that's why I have a tough time taking it seriously. I'm trying to, to remember if there's anything like truly meaningful that really stood out to me that kind of caught my eye. And um, I don't know, uh, Jalen Naylor, maybe with the second team. Yeah, yeah. The wide Addison, receiver. fourth nice, wide receiver. Nice feather four. in his cap. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think that that's probably the only like really telling thing is that they've already got Naylor above Rager and above Powell. And that's without doing anything in training camp. He had one day and then got hurt. So that was telling. Otherwise I'm not going to take it too seriously. Yeah, I will say first and foremost, I mean, just after covering the Vikings in football, right? Just in general for almost 10 years now, I, I always like to remind folks at this time, the two positions that you just can't fairly evaluate during training camp practice running backs and safeties like until you actually get into a live game the bullets start flying it's so hard if not close to impossible really to fairly and accurately assess the play of running backs and safeties so I know a lot was made again about this new running back rotation we've talked about for months who's going to be the first man up behind Madison then you see Kenny's name up there and everyone's kind of crowned him as running back two now for the whole year pump the brakes Uh, that's all I'm going to say because until we see these guys actually run full speed into an eight or nine man box and see how, you know, they can bounce off tackles and the physical part of their game. It's just too hard to tell who looks the part and who's got the edge right now. And the same can be said about safeties too. I mean, it's feeling more and more like Bynum is, is cemented as the starter. Okay. I get that. Metellus kind of got this new role carved out as this joker moving all over the field. And then you got poor Louis seen buried at the bottom. But again, until you see these guys pursue and tackle, stick their face in the fan, and wrap some of these guys up. It's just too difficult to analyze and make make a fair assessment on who looks the part mm-hmm. of a starter in this Flores defense quite yet. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, on paper, Ken is the man today, but a lot can and will change now from this point until week one. And regardless who's the backup on the depth chart, I think you're going to see a heavy rotation of all three of these guys throughout the season. Other takeaways, like Brandell over at right guard, not just guard, but right guard, thought that was kind of interesting. Again, I thought it was noteworthy to see him inside on the interior to begin with when OTAs and minicamp started back in May. Now to see him getting serious run on the right side. Sam, have you seen him taking reps on the right side? I can't imagine they would just fling that out. Hey, well, yeah, we're going to put this on the depth chart at right guard even though he hasn't taken any snaps yeah so i mean maybe they just had to put him somewhere like maybe they they view him yeah. as more of just a flexibility guy but they had to they had to give him a label so they gave him right guard because keep an eye on josh sokol luke no one's talking about josh sokol no one had him in their 53 josh sokol has center flexibility and he can play i think all three interior spots that's a, a practice squad pickup last year, second year in the league, Josh Sokol. Uh, this is also notable, Luke. Remember, we talked about how veterans always get the benefit of the doubt, except for Chris Reed. Chris Reed buried on the third team. Mm. I know that he's injured right now, but mm. I think that's a very cuttable contract. Chris Reed is on the chopping block, especially if Josh Sokol has proven he can play all the interior spots. Blake Brandell or Brandel has the interior uh, flexibility as well. 
I think Chris Reed is on the outs, man. I think that that the second team group that you see here, Lowe, Sokol, Schlotman, Brandel, and Udo, that may very well be your backup group. It's so important and valuable for some of these offensive linemen, specifically interior, to be able to play multiple positions. So first of all, great shout out to Sokol. I'm going to jot that down in my notes. And then back to Brando, like great sign for things to come, I guess, as this Swiss Army knife and just total a utility guy up and down at least three different spots now on the line of scrimmage, if not even four, being that of maybe a backup right tackle as well. So love to see that. It's been years since it's felt like the Vikings have had a a good backup swing lineman, you know, Rashad Hill days. That was more of a tackle, though, not interior. And Brandel, and maybe Sokol as well now, it sounds like, seems to be kind of carving out those roles for themselves kind of nicely. Um, just scanning through my notes here, you mentioned the defensive line. We knew this defensive line rotation was going to be like, okay, there's nine guys for maybe two, maybe three spots at most. They all feel like they kind of have an equal crack at a roster spot right now. James Lynch goes down on the IR. That was a bummer to see. And you know they're going to rotate all these guys in in the preseason and regular season for that matter. But, yeah, you're right, man. To see Ross Blacklock ahead of guys like Assezi, like I thought that was very interesting. Again, haven't heard Assezi's name much yet, but how that whole thing plays out between Juquel and Roy and Jonathan Bullard. You got Sheldon Day back there, Aho at the bottom. That's something I'm going to keep a close eye on for sure. Last thing real quick, I know you mentioned it, Andrew Booth. Does he have a pulse, or is this just like a total sick joke they're playing on us? Listed ahead of backups, Joan Williams, or with Joan, I should say, but yeah. ahead of guys like Makai Blackman, you called it out. Despite the fact we've seen Blackman get all the first-team reps in the nickel since basically the start of camp. So, yeah, I don't know what's going up with that. Maybe some sick mind games going on. But again, a lot will change from now until week one regardless. But those are probably the biggest takeaways, you're right, from the Vikings' first official depth chart of the 2023 season. Uh, any final thoughts, Sam, or specific news and notes from yesterday's practice mm -hmm. specifically you can share? I know a lot's been made about TJ Hawkinson, his kind of status as of late. What's going on? Uh, any other specific players or big splash plays that kind of stood out from practice number eight yesterday? Yeah, let, let's work backward. All right, so you you brought up the, the defensive line. One player I want to highlight, and I don't know what they're going to do with him, is Andre Carter because he's he's behind the eight ball, right? He's two practices in, had to come off an injury, was getting some work with the twos, are they going to carve out a role for him and on the roster? Um, so highly paid as an undrafted free agent. When you give a guy that kind of money, it, you probably want him on the team. They've got Benton Whitley above him on the depth chart at outside linebacker. Luigi Villain, I think, has a case, but I don't know. Benton Whitley is yeah. not, uh, not, not a threat to make this roster. So even if Andre Carter is behind, do they find a place for him to kind of redshirt on this team? So that's one. Cornerback situation, Andrew Booth Jr. was back as a full participant yesterday, participating with the twos. So I, I guess you can still view Booth as a second teamer. Maybe that makes sense. Um, and they're trying not to insult Juwan Williams and put him with threes on this, on this depth chart. And again, Luke, this depth chart only has room for two cornerbacks on it when we know that most formations have a nickel. So they're just kind of limiting themselves in the way they're they're – labeling it. So I guess I'm not going to read too much into that. Um, TJ Hawkinson, you brought up, it was mentioned yesterday that he had a, an illness, um, which I, there, there's scuttlebutt, right? There's whispering about, is this a hold in? Is this contract related? Are they giving us excuses about why TJ Hawkinson is not participating? Cause if he's ill, well, first of all, that would mean he's been ill for a good four days because this is going back to the weekend. Right. Um, and if he's ill, why is he even out there at all? Why is he even participating in anything? It's just it doesn't quite add up. Um, did he like get deathly ill and lose a bunch of weight? Does he need to rehab? I, I, that's what I don't really understand. It's vague. It's confusing. And it would make sense if he was getting a little frustrated about this contract thing. You, you would think that this would be sorted out by now, August 8th going into his contract year. So I think that is a little bit alarming, but we just, we don't know. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes there. Uh, yesterday at practice, Luke, Daniil Hunter getting the most work he's had yet. And occasionally in offensive line versus defensive line drills, seeing him go up against 
a rehabbing Brian O'Neill, who, again, hasn't done full contact work yet with the team, but it started to do individual drills in full pads. So we saw the two guys we were worried about, Daniil Hunter and Brian O'Neill, going toe-to-toe yesterday, one against one. That was a lot of fun to watch, and Daniil Hunter was flying around yesterday. There was even a look where they put Daniil Hunter's hand in the dirt as a down lineman with Davenport on one edge and Wanham on the other edge. Ooh. That was kind of an interesting little wrinkle that I'm not sure we expected to see. I love to hear that, Michael Strahan record. Watch out. You're on alert. It's Brian Flores' defense has just given this offense so many fits day in and day out. Yeah, I've I've seen this defense ruin some sessions where, like, you know, you know how it goes where the rush gets home and, okay, it's a sack. Um, but then the play continues and the quarterback completes it, but it doesn't feel like it's real because they had eight seconds to do it. <laughs> a lot of that. A lot of that. Like, I think Luigi Villain had one yesterday where he all but slapped the ball out of Kirk Cousins' hand and then, you know, did one of these. And then Kirk goes and runs out of the pocket and throws it to a guy. So a lot of plays that were extended but would not have been extended in a real game. That's the kind of pressure they were getting. There were two interceptions yesterday. Um, it was Williams picking off Cousins, really bad throw by Cousins, and then Troy Dye with a one-hander mm. against, was it Jaron Hall or Nick Mullins? It was one of the backups. One-hander for Troy Dye, who continues to to run with the twos. So, And plenty of other interceptable balls as well that were almost picked. It was a lively day of throwing the ball yesterday, and man, I, t- I said this on the Ron Johnson show today, and I'm going to reiterate it. Um, Jordan Addison is having a better rookie year training camp than Justin Jefferson's it. rookie year training camp. Wow. It's probably on par more with Stefan Diggs. I was going to ask you, of the Diggs, three, how would you rank the three thus far, eight practices in? Um, Diggs was always, and always has been, a better, a pra- monster, a better practice player than Justin Jefferson. I don't really know why. I don't know if it's just like he just burns with this competitive fire. Um, and I, I think that Diggs has a little more of that dog in him where he wants to impress people in the crowd. He wants to show up the cornerback across from him. Like he was so competitive in those settings. Diggs just dominated training camp. He was so good. Addison is probably not at Diggs level, but he has been awfully impressive. Catches everything. I mean, he's he is so good and comfortable in contested situations or in tight quarters where his toes are up against the sideline. He doesn't seem scared of anything. And for his size, that's pretty impressive to watch. God, as good as Diggs was, as dominant as he was during training camp. I remember standing on the sidelines with you and watching that man just ball out. Mike Zimmer still didn't start that guy until what, week three? Yeah. Or something like that. Like, like, what are we doing? What, What more do you need to see, Mike? What can I do? Help me help you, Mike. Uh, classic Charles days. Johnson just Charles had his heart. Charles Johnson at the helm. Yeah. Let me just go back to the defense real quick before we move on, because I'll tell you what, they, they have clearly set the tone early and often in camp this far, and given this offense major fits, as you've said. I think the big hope and takeaway, though, you kind of got to lean into is the fact that this should all be worth its weight in gold for this offensive line specifically by the time you get to the regular season. Like they've gone through so much stress and pressure, making the right checks and calls every day of practice. That's really forced them, along with Kirk Cousins, to learn and grow from a communication standpoint, if nothing else now, while it's still just practice. So by the time they get to an actual game that actually means something, they're more than prepared to ready to roll. I heard an interview with Christian Derrissaw yesterday, and he said, you know what? By the time we get to the regular season and face just a normal 4-3 base defense again for the first time in a while, it's going to look like second-grade math compared to the algebra and pre-calc that we've been facing every day with Brian Flores' defense. So uh, iron sharpening iron, that's always the cliche, but as much as the offense looks beaten and battered and, and somewhat lost at times, it should, mm-hmm. in theory, only make this entire unit better when the lights finally flip on in week one versus Tampa Bay at the bank. So that's the good news and kind of the glass half full way to think about it. Kind of the way the optimistic approach I'm, I'm choosing to look at this offense yeah. as they well, kind of continue you, to Wouldn't adjust. you rather have the defense showing this Absolutely. than the offense? Because we oh. kind of know... We kind of know that the offense is probably going to be okay, right? The off- mm-hmm. We know that the offensive line is going to be imperfect. Yeah, but- they needed a new test. Let's be honest. 
Yeah, like I'd rather see the defense build its confidence, figure out how to do 12 different kinds of exotic blitzes, even if it comes at the offense's expense, because they're just more equipped to handle that sort of thing in the regular season. Like I'm more confident that they will be okay. So just let the defense beat up on them by all means. If it helps them develop quickly, then yeah, do it. Do it. Ruin practice. That's fine. Yeah, 100% agreed. Well said. Uh, Coming up next, deep dive into preseason game number one versus the Seahawks. But first, don't forget, we're presented by FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Locked On, America's number one sports book and official sports book partner of the NFL. Football season about to kick off. FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Check this out right now. When you bet on a Super Bowl winner, You can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl. You'll get bonus bets for every single victory. How great is that? You can use those bonus bets on money lines, player props, over-unders. You name it, they got it. So think about it. You want to bet on the Vikes 25-1 to to win it all. Every time they win in the regular season, you're getting free bonus bets back. Go check it out. FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on today. All right, Sam. The Vikings season officially kicks off Thursday versus the Seahawks, preseason game number one in Seattle. You've been out there at camp for the past two weeks. You've seen this team. You kind of know what it's all starting to look like now. You know who's looking good, who's struggling, all that stuff. So I guess what's just the two or three biggest things you're looking forward to finding out in this game when you sit down and you watch these 90 guys take the field for the first time? Yeah, well, I'm not expecting a lot of sexiness. Um are they even going to have a fullback? I don't know. I don't know if you play CJ Ham in this game, you might have no fullback. So it's not it's just not going to be a great reflection of your offense as a whole, of your defense as a whole. You got to look for individual performances. Running back will be very interesting. Mm-hmm. I doubt Madison plays and Kane Wangwu is banged up. So get ready for a heavy one-two punch of Dwayne McBride and Ty Chandler. And I love that. I think that's going to be awesome. Give them each a half um, and see what they can do. That's going to be super telling to see how they handle things. And then you're you're watching, I think, I think there's some key young players that probably will contribute on this team that will play in this game. Like I, I'm expecting to see Booth. I'm expecting to see Blackman. Jordan Addison has already been announced that he will be playing. That's enormous. How is Addison going to fare? on this uh, on this Vikings team. So I'm watching, obviously, the young guys, the young guys that are trying to play their way up the depth chart. Um, and defensively, how aggressive are they going to be? Are they going to unleash some things in the preseason or are they going to save it for the regular season, right? We, we often see coaches hold on to their best stuff for when the games matter. So we might not see the full Flores experience in this game, but it'd be fun to get a couple exotic blitzes in there just to just to practice them just to show blitz and then back off and see who's dropping in coverage i do want to see a little bit of that just to see how it's going to look when the bullets are flying yeah totally agree on the running backs and i mentioned it running backs and safeties watch these guys for the first time those two position groups i'm really going to be honing in on those guys because i mentioned it it's just so tough to analyze those guys during practice until the bullets are actually flying in a real game guys can really use that physicality you know forced to break tackles or wrap guys up and bring them down plus the safety specifically taking the right angles in pursuit that's so important and so tough to grade during practice when guys aren't necessarily going 100 percent balls to the wall each and every rep until the whistle blows and things like that and the other thing too that I was really thinking about this goes back to kind of just a general theme we see every year during training camp is it happens day in and day out, by the way, on social media, you see a new clip that goes viral because somebody made a sick catch or a big play, but there's two position groups when it comes to that. I'll specifically call them out that are so unfairly treated and misjudged Sam, because it mm-hmm. just takes one clip for people to say, Oh, that guy's toast or that dude can't play. He's washed because all these clips we see every day, that's the offensive line and the cornerbacks because 
what happens? I see it every day, Sam, five times a week. Byron Murphy could put together nine great reps, and then all of a sudden he gets beat in a one-on-one, and all of a sudden people want to say, oh, maybe this guy's lost a step, or yeah, maybe Byron Murphy's not a true number one kind of guy. Same with the offensive line, too. Like You get these one-on-one drills going, and Ezra Cleveland, let's just say, for example, puts five great reps together, and then all of a sudden he gets beat on a swim move or something, and someone posts it online, it blows up, and everyone starts to think and clamor, Ezra Cleveland, he doesn't know how to play football anymore. Stop it. <laughs> That's not the case. Like These things get blown way out of proportion. It happens every year at this time during camp, and I get it. Like It's a fun splash play. I'm out at practice. It's what's right in front of us right now. People get excited. They get jacked up. They want to post it for the world to see. But please, like I'm begging you, don't grade a guy based off one single snap or play in a vacuum. You know, you just saw him get beat from a nine-second clip you see on Twitter, right? Like There's far Mm -hmm. more to it. There's a bigger body of work. I promise you that. So offensive linemen and cornerbacks this Thursday night versus the Seahawks watching their entire body of work. Who's putting together and displaying consistent bodies of work? Snap in, snap out. That's another big thing I want to see just in general. Um, when it comes would to you players, play, Would you play Ingram in the game? Projected starter, would you play him? Yeah, I would. I really would. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe for just a series or two, but um, I, I got to know how he's looking. against Again, real competition, different yeah. skill sets. And he's at this point in his career where you've already pushed the chips in, Sam, and he's committed like, Okay, we're rolling with this guy, but he still needs a lot of reps, real game reps, before he can truly develop into the guy. We hope he can be drafted as a second-round pick, top 60 pick just last season. So, yeah, I would. I'm not saying play him a whole half even, but a series or two, I think that'd be really good for him to get some more film on tape, go back to the coaches in the film room, and just start to dissect some things, some little nuances, footwork, technique, things like that, that I think we all know and understand and I think even Ed would tell you this himself, that he can still clean up and work on at this point. So, yeah, yeah. series or two, um, I would actually prefer that. I'm not even on the fence. I hope he gets a series or yeah. two just to progress and develop a little bit. Learning more. not to step on the quarterback's foot, things like I that. I think that would Te- help. Technical yeah, things. Yeah, I think that would help. Um, specific players, though. You know, I'm a huge draft nut, so all the rookies. I mean, Addison, of course, Jaqueline Roy, Dwayne McBride, you mentioned. I want to see them all. I'm not going to lie, but you made me pick one, you already know who I'm going to say, Ivan Pace. I just want to see that dude lace him up and get after it against real live competition. This guy's been so fun to watch during practice. And even though he's going to have his rookie moments, he's not going to come out and look like Zach Thomas. But I just can't wait to see the burst, the big playability he brings to the table. And also, just kind of where he fits inside this Brian Flores defense, right? Is he a sub-package guy only? Is he a base guy? Is he really going to end up being a starter or working his way into the ones by the time we get to week one in the regular season. Uh, And then last thing too, I got to mention Jaron Hall. He's a rookie as well, but just where's he at? Where's he at in his development? How's he progressing? Is is the game starting to slow down for him yet at all? Like, can he do the hard part, which is calling the right play, having the right verbiage, then getting up to the line of scrimmage, making the right checks and calls. And then once you've done the hard part, then it's just go do what you do best. Go play football, sling it around, make some big-time throws, move around in the pocket, use your athleticism, create some big plays with your feet. I think he's going to be a low-key topic behind the curtains all season long for fans, and people just want to know, is he a potential bridge for life after Kirk Cousins in 2024? I get it. This is just one game. It's the first game ever in the NFL for him, but you just want to get a read. Where are we at? We just want to figure out how far away we are in his overall development, I guess. Um, any final thoughts, any you know, last takeaways here before this Thursday game versus the Seahawks? Well, you know we've got our uh, our preseason fantasy rosters. I can't so wait. You pulled really... up those teams yesterday. I, I like my team. You got a great team. You drafted a great team, Sam, but I like my team too. I'm not going to lie. You've got McBride, right? I got McBride. Who's the one? I think one. McBride I is going to be win. a workhorse. Yeah. I think he's going to get a lot of work. And so it's going to come down to who scores the TDs. Um and again, defensive players. I think you've got Andre Carter. He's he's probably yeah. not going to play. Yep. But whoever has Ivan Pace, it might be a ten tackle performance. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to add a whole lot of intrigue on Thursday night. 
Absolutely. Uh, let's end with a fun one. Everyone's favorite little game we like to call What's More Likely. Um, let me get some tunes on real quick. Get the game show vibe going. What did we roll with last time? Was it Rock? Was it we, low? Oh, yeah. I think it was Rock. I think we rolled with Rock. Can we try? Let's try a little dance pop. A little game show vibe. Let's. let's. Oh, I'm in the club. DJ Spin is. Uh-oh. Watch out. Here we go. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Let's roll with it. All Number right. Number one. First one up. What's more likely? Kirk Cousins breaks his career passing yardage record. By the way, currently sitting at 4,917 yards. That was with Washington all the way back in 2016. Uh, his most yards in Minnesota was last year. I'm sure you remember that. 4,500 yards. Or J.J. breaking his career receiving yardage record, which is 1,809 yards, obviously set last year. Now, I know these two kind of go hand in hand, Sam. Well, I got ripped on this show for suggesting that Kirk Cousins could be a 5,000-yard guy. Um, J.J. got shut down in how many games last year? Like straight up, almost shut out against the Cowboys, the mm -hmm. Packers, the Lion Lions did it to him. So if he can just if he can just have like a higher baseline and not get and I think the Vikings will have some better ways to to avoid him getting shut down. I am going to go with JJ exceeding that total and I don't know if it's 2000 yards but again 1800 plus yeah I think that's doable. Yeah, it's certainly again. All right, if you think Kirk's going to throw for almost five, then you got to have JJ for close to almost two thousand, which sounds ridiculous, but it's not. It just feels like there's more mouths to feed now, even with Adam Thielen gone. Just with what Addison's been doing with the first team, obviously KJ Osborne taking on a bigger role. TJ Hawkinson's going to have a full off season now to get comfortable. So that one's going to be interesting. Uh, next one up, which game? Are the Vikings more likely to pull an upset in 2023? Week five versus the Chiefs, that's at the bank. Or week two on the road versus the Philadelphia Eagles, that's on Thursday night football. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I checked, by the way, Chiefs tickets at the bank. Cheapest ticket to get in the door right now, $285. Woo! Uh, that's going to be a very red crowd because Kansas City just travels like crazy and it's close. So beside the point, Eagles or Chiefs, I mean, I, I, it makes more sense to say that they're going to win at home, right? The Chiefs sometimes start a little more slowly as they, they get kind of into a groove, kind of like the, you know, the dynasty Patriots used to. The Chiefs have so many bigger fish to fry that you might catch them in a down week in week five. But there's also... The wackiness of Thursday night, Super Bowl hangover for the Eagles, and you've got the freshness of this Flores defense that might be able to throw some new things out at Philadelphia and catch them off guard that they don't see on tape. So I'm actually going to go with week two at Philly. Ooh, interesting. What if I said Niners at home week seven or Bengals on the road week 15? Because I was kind of back and forth which one I should ask, but I'll just fling it out anyways. What do you think? Niners at home week seven or Bengals on the road week 15? Niners at home. I, I don't know who the Niners quarterback is going to be. I mean, I still don't. Even though as good as they were last year, I don't have 100% faith in, in what they are going to look like this year. I'm going to go Niners. Yeah, and the fact that D'Amico Ryans is gone, anytime you see a top five, top three defense and their defensive coordinator leaves, there's usually a little adjustment period there. So I'm interested to see not only offense, which gets all the spotlight, who's going to be their quarterback, but the defensive side of the ball as well. I know the talent's still there, but how that transition looks like for life after D'Amico Ryans. Uh, what if I said which game are the Vikings more likely to get upset in? Week nine versus the Falcons on the road in Atlanta or week six versus the Bears at Soldier Field. At Soldier. Yeah, going outside. Maybe it's windy. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's some some still some weird mojo there. I'm of the I'm of the persuasion that the Soldier Field curse has been lifted. Aren't the Vikings like four and three in the last seven games? I mean, I think they've done enough to dispel the the bad mojo, but Maybe Justin Fields will just go off. I, I, I do think that he's probably sitting on a pretty nice year. I'm not convinced about their team success, but yeah, the Bears scare me. I'll go Bears. Yeah, you won't find a more pessimistic person when it comes to the Vikings traveling at Soldier, but I will say the one thing I'm worried about this Vikings defense 
is their run stopping ability. And the Atlanta Falcons with B. John Robinson, a top 10 offensive line, Tyler Algier, Desmond Ritter at the helm. I am worried that they're just going to pull a Dallas Cowboys like they did to the Vikings at home last year at the bank and just run the ball down the Vikings throat and just win the trench game. A little bit worried about that one as well. Uh, Next one up, third year player you trust to make the proverbial leap this year, a bigger leap, safety cam Bynum or running back Kenne Wongo. What do you think? Big leap. Yeah, I think it's Bynum because I think Wang Wu is susceptible to lose that battle yeah. for the backup job, whereas Cam Bynum is a starter. So we could be talking about a starter versus a third string running back. And I think that Bynum is in a great position now in this Flores defense, which really empowers safeties. I don't think safeties were empowered. They were kind of the last line of defense last year as everyone else let guys have major cushions and make catches. I think that the safety position is going to look really, really cool this year for the Vikings. So I've got Bynum. Well, what if I said sophomore player you trust more to make the leap this year? Brian Osamwa or Caleb Evans? Who's going to make a bigger splash and cement themselves in when we look back at the end of the year and say that guy's a core guy of this defense? Yeah, I'm going to go Evans. I, I think that one's really close. That's basically a tie. But there's something about the way that they've trusted Evans all the way through. Evans played like 140 snaps last year, had concussion problems, but they've clearly seen something that that has given the Vikings confidence to just allow him to have this job. No competition whatsoever. And I think he's played really well in camp. They love his size. And think about this. When the Vikings have um, like Jawan Williams on the field and a Caleb Evans on the field. That's a big secondary all of a sudden. So I'm I like I like what Evans has shown. I'm gonna go with him. What if I said Ty Chandler or Jalen Naylor? That one's a tough one too, I feel like. When we look yeah. back at the end of the year, who are you gonna have more optimism about or say this is a core piece moving forward? That one's tough. Yeah. It's hard to think of anybody as a core piece at wide receiver when you have such a clear top three, right? There's only so many targets to go around and your wide receiver four might be very promising, but it's going to be hard for Naylor to make any sort of splash. I think Chandler can make a legitimate splash and there might be some games where he's their leading rusher. If he indeed gets that number two job, I still think he's the favorite. So I'm going to go Chandler. Yeah, that's more than fair. Love the case you just laid out. I will say KJ Osborne may be a free agent, or, you know, maybe not with the team in 2024 yeah. because he's a pending free agent. And if Jalen Naylor shows the goods like he did last year, he could just be the clear cut. Oh, you're just going to step right into this new wide receiver three role. We know KOC loves to run and roll with that 11 personnel. All right. What's more likely to be a higher total? The Vikings wins or Justin Jefferson TDs? JJ, as good as he is, scored seven. 10 and only eight TDs last year. So through three seasons, he's averaging like 8.2, 8.3. Never scored yep. more than 10 in a season. More wins or JJ TDs? What say you? That's that's good because 8.3 is the touchdown average and 8.5 is the Vegas over under. Mm-hmm. I think I'll go JJ TDs. I think he's sitting on double-digit TDs. He's got to be. I don't know if the Vikings... I can't say with certainty the Vikings are a double-digit win team. Yeah. Yeah. TDs just fluctuate. You know, fantasy lens here now for a sec. TDs just fluctuate so much year to year. It's kind of a crapshoot, right? And the fact that he's so good and so dominant and has never scored more than 10 touchdowns and only averages 8.2... Man, that, that just seems wild and ridiculous to me. I, I, I'm with you on that one. Last one here. What's more likely to happen first? Brian Flores leads a top 10 defense as a defensive coordinator, or Brian Flores becomes a head coach again in the NFL? What's more likely? Head coach. If we get one one crack at this thing, at defensive coordinator, is he going to be top 10 this year? No. No, I'm not that pie in the sky. I would love to 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 see it, but no. If he's top 20, that would be a nice accomplishment. Top 10 is tough. I mean, I probably don't have time to look it up right now, but if you look at the 10th ranked defense last year, the gap between that 
and the Vikings, I think that's too much to make up. So, yeah, we'll go ahead, Coach. I, I'm not, like, I don't even think Flores needs to be wonderful as a coordinator to get a head coaching job. I just think head coaching job is so much about presence, about personality, and I think he has that. He has that aura about him. So I, I think that he could be a one-and-done Tomlin-esque and move on somewhere else. Yeah, you know, everybody, the A topic, when we look at just the personnel and roster next year, obviously Kirk Cousins, the quarterback position, nothing more important. But I will say, trying to do everything you can to keep Brian Flores around for multiple years has got to be near the top of the priority list when this is all said and done. If what we're seeing comes to fruition here and this uh, defense actually shows some major improvement. All right, that's a wrap. That was fun, man. Great stuff per usual. Thank I can't you. wait to pick your brain on tomorrow's mailbag episode and get all caught up from day nine of training camp. Uh, have fun out there today. As always, bring the SPF 50, find some shade. And again, quick reminder, all you guys listening at home, we'll have all the training camp and preseason coverage all month long up on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota channel and right here every day on the Minnesota Football Party. That's a wrap today. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Join us every day for another episode of the Football Party. It's your one-stop shop breakdown. Everything Minnesota Vikings. That's Sam Ekstrom on Twitter, at Sam Ekstrom. Check him out every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to the Football Party, part of the Lockdown Sports Minnesota Network. We're back tomorrow with the Mailbag Edition with Kara Levin's very own Reggie Wilson. But until then, I'm Luke Inman on Twitter, at Luke underscore Spinman. Signing out.